start over. So thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for tuning into the Double Line Income Fund webcast hosted by portfolio managers Ken Shinoda and Morris Chen. Before we dive into today's webcast, some notable upcoming webcasts include the Double Line Floating Rate Fund on May 23rd, hosted by portfolio managers Robert Cohen and Phil Kenny. And on June 6th, Double Line CEO and CIO Jeffrey Gunlock and portfolio manager Andrew Sue will host a webcast for the Double Line Total Return Bond Fund. To register for these webcasts, please visit DoubleLine.com. Outside of our webcast, we also produce a variety of thought leadership uh, available on our website. Ken Shinoda, who is on today's call, hosts a monthly video series, Channel 11, that reviews market and macro drivers across various asset classes. We also have two podcasts, the Monday Morning Minutes podcast, hosted by portfolio managers Sam Lau and Jeff Mayberry, which is released every Friday afternoon and covers timely market commentary and macro events for the week. And the Sherman Show podcast hosted by Deputy CIO Jeff Sherman and Sam Lau. Lastly, PS Perspectives is a monthly series hosted by our product specialist team, exploring DoubleLine's latest thoughts on financial markets. These videos can be found on the DoubleLine Capital YouTube page. Moving on to fund offerings, the DoubleLine Income Fund is offered with two share classes, a retail share class and an institutional share class, Minimum investment amounts and expense ratio details are listed on the slide for both share classes. Looking at performance, the income fund institutional share class has returned 1.44% year to date through April 30th. And the fund's performance has been particularly strong since the depths of March of 2020. Over the three year period ending April 30th, the institutional share class ticker DBLIX has returned 2.62% on an annualized basis relative to the Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index return of negative 3.15% annualized for a total outperformance of 577 basis points annualized over the last three years. And on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you can see the fund's 30-day SEC yield of just north of 9% for the institutional share class. With that, let me turn the webcast over to portfolio managers Ken Shinoda and Morris Chen. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Phil. Appreciate the intro. Give me a second to like load up these slides here. All right. So, uh, as Phil noted, SEC yield of uh, nine point two percent net. Still a pretty short interest rate duration of two and a half years. Weighted average life around five. Fifty one percent of the portfolio floating rate. Again, why take a look at the income fund? It is a diversified source of income that's coming from different sectors. Uh, in the securitized space, which is going to be uh, some diversification from corporate credit alternatives, whether that be investment grade corporate bonds or high yield or bank loans. Uh, we generally carry a lower interest rate risk than intermediate term funds uh, with the, uh, the Bloomberg aggregate index having a duration of around 6.25 years or so and uh, us being much, much shorter right now. So it's a complimentary way to get some diversity in your portfolio and some higher yields. All right, taking a deeper dive here, um, you can see that our largest weighting is to the residential mortgage credit sector, being about 31% of the portfolio. Pretty diversified across the subsectors of RMBS with a, a tilt on credit risk transfer, which are floating rate, packaged up bonds from Fannie and Freddie. It's a very high collateral, high quality collateral. Non-QM, our new non-agency, non mortgage bonds, uh, reperforming, non-performing loan bonds, about 4% of the portfolio. Um, next largest weighting to CMBS, uh, 21%. And I'm gonna leave those details from Morris Chen to cover. Uh, and CLOs, 24% of the portfolio, mix of investment grade, below investment grade. So the credit quality we've been increasing in the portfolio, uh, we've uh, increased the investment grade broadly. It's about uh, on the top right hand side, you can see almost half the portfolio is now investment grade, which is a change from about two, three years ago, because with short term rates much higher and just yields and spreads wider broadly, you don't really have to go down to the, the very kind of below investment grade parts of the market to, to capture yield. We can we can stick with kind of a more blended approach with higher quality investment grade. Uh, agency mortgages, 6% of the portfolio, also one of the cheaper parts of the market. We'll look at some slides on that in a little bit. 
and um, ABS about 8%. Um, so far, you know, we're up a little under 2% this year. It's a little bit lower than the broader market. Um, the the non-agencies are up around 5.5%. The agency book is up around 3.5%. CMBS, even with the headlines, still up about 2.5%. CLO is up about 8 uh, We just got hit on some of the ABS bonds when the Credit Suisse uh, broker dealer portfolio got sold. We had some matchers that were on that list and uh, some of those bonds that are a little bit more esoteric got hit. So we're dragging a little bit behind, but we have a lot of yield, which should hatch up, help us catch up throughout the year and securitized spreads are still very wide relative to, to corporates. So I think some catch up in spread tightening that the corporate market has seen will help us catch up um, to, to some of the um, sectors that are lagging a little bit here. So key takeaways, you know, heavy in uh, mortgage related assets, you know, over 50% if you include agency, non-agency and CMBS together, and then an upgrade in quality of the portfolio to almost 50% in investment grade now. And uh, I'll let Morris touch on the, the commercial side, but only 22% of our CMBS is in office. And that's below average for if you just broadly own the CMBS market. As far as what are the, what's kind of like the risk and protection in the portfolio, these are the different sectors and what the current delinquency rates are relative to a metric called credit enhancement. And credit enhancement is the percentage of bonds below you that needs to get totally wiped out before you get your first dollar loss. And so for example, on the CMBS front, 2.3% delinquent, that could be totally wiped out and you would still be fine. You wouldn't get hit on your bonds. In fact, you would need delinquencies to rise up almost fivefold and have 100% loss on every asset liquidated before you get hit. So based on these metrics, we have a lot of coverage, kind of a loss coverage ratio based upon the credit enhancement and how, how delinquent these, these loans are. So we think we're in a really good spot right now. Obviously delinquencies could rise into a recession, but based on historical defaults through recessionary cycles, we think that we, you know, we've done the credit work and we believe in the, this portfolio. I had a question come through, um, and I'll, I'll just I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer it early. It's about DBLIX relative to two new ETFs that we launched, DCMB, DMB ask, asking about, you know, what's the better risk reward? They're really different portfolios. Um, DMBS is a super high quality agency mortgage and non-agency mortgage security, 100% mortgages high quality investment grade and our government guaranteed. It's benchmarked against the Bloomberg Mortgage Index. Um, so again, very different risk profile, different yield profile on that. It's got yields, the underlying assets yield in the mid to high fours today versus almost 10% in the income fund. And then DCMB is also a high quality short duration CMBS portfolio that is uh, uh, largely investment grade or all investment grade today largely triple A's, and that's focused against short duration CMBS. So different uh, mix of assets, different risk profile. This is uh, income is going to be a little bit more diversified and a little bit further down the capital structure, a little bit more yield seeking. So um, again, those two portfolios, yields of in the high fours on DMBS, mid sixes on, uh, on CMB, uh, DCMB. This is the yield to maturity of the underlying assets, not the SEC yield. And uh, on income, um, it's, it's a little bit uh, on the higher yielding part of the capital structure. So let's take a look at the fixed income markets. It's been a, a decent year so far. We're off the highs of January. We had that euphoric uh, spike in, oh, got all dark all of a sudden, spike in uh, 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 returns across many asset classes in January, but broadly, you see that uh, high quality parts of the market, like treasuries and agency mortgages, are up about three, three and a half percent. Um, in the in the beige on the towards the kind of right hand side, you can see that that's that's uh, the corporate credit markets. This is through April 30th. Both IG and high yield up north of four percent. Both have given some back um, in the last uh, uh, through May, mid May here, uh, and bank loans also up three, four percent. So everything is kind of up. Um, the securitized markets, a little bit shorter duration, so up a little bit less. Also, spreads are still wide relative to corporates, so we have some room to catch up. Um, the only thing that's negative here uh, on this screen is that CMBS below invest, uh, the triple B portion of CMBS, given some of the headline risk around the commercial mortgage market. And if I had an index for 
kind of more esoteric parts of the ABS market, those are also lagging the broader markets. But you know, while we're off the highs in yield, there's still a lot of yield out there. On the left-hand side, you can see going into more traditional parts of fixed income, again, treasury agency mortgages, corporate bonds. You can mix those together in an index type portfolio, get a yield something like you know, mid fours with a mix of treasuries, agency mortgages, and IG. And then if you add some of the plus sectors and the non-traditional parts of the market, some of the securitized sectors and higher yielding parts of the corporate market, maybe a little EM, now you're getting bond funds out there on the intermediate category that have yields around five and a half to 6%. So competitive with long run equity returns in some instances, especially at the risk spectrum um, that should provide, we think, diversity to, to equities, uh, unlike last year, which was a year where correlations went to one. Securitized yields look especially high relative to history um, because a lot of these assets sit on the shorter end of the curve and the curve is inverted. Uh, here you can see four of the benchmark sectors within the securitized markets. On the top left is the non-agency mortgage market. This is an example of a non-qualified mortgage bond looking across the capital structure, AAA down to double B. Um, CMBS conduit on the top right-hand side, AAA down to double B. ABS subprime auto deal on the bottom left and a traditional kind of CLO, floating rate CLO structure on the bottom right. right we're, we're off the highs in yields. The yield highs were probably around October um, of, uh, of last year when uh, we just had a ton of supply, kind of peak Fed, you know, fears about hiking rates. And, um, and we, we, you know, the tenure peaked around October. Uh, we're off the highs, but you can still find that there's investment grade pockets of the market where you can find close to double digit type yields, um, you know, eight, nine percent yield in RMBS and CLOs, 11 percent yield for triple B CMBS. You know, for a reason, there's some risk associated with office. So there's a reason it's wider there. Uh, but again, you can find some pretty attractive yields out there. We're off the highs and triple A non-agency, as an example, got all the way up to seven percent plus yield spread of 250, uh, the two year got, you know, north of 4% to 5% for a moment pre Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, the spreads have come in a little bit and short term rates and long term rates have fallen. But we're still talking about pretty attractive all in yields relative to history, you can see a year back, everything was in kind of the twos. And if you went all the way to the bottom of the capital structure, you were lucky to get double digits. Here you can get mid teens and things like double B CLOs. We think rates have topped um on the 10 year was last year we got up to about 430 ish and we've been in this weird tight trading range over the last couple months on the 10 year in equities for that matter too it feels like the s p 500 has been 4100 plus or minus one and a half percent for like the last 30 days the two year uh peaked right before silicon valley bank we think uh, that's come down a lot too so we think both these Rates have peaked. Um, you know, there could be maybe one more surprise to the upside. We get a surprise on inflation up, and maybe uh, these rates back up a little bit. But you know, we were kind of talking to everyone about the buy zone being somewhere between 375 and 4 percent on the 10-year. Um, I think after Silicon Valley Bank and the kind of the the, the pullback in lending from regional banks, I don't know if the market has the ability for the 10-year to get back up towards that 4 percent. So I would say. If you haven't added duration to your portfolios and you're looking to bring that buy zone down a little bit, um, we're backing up today here. We saw about 355 on the 10 year. If we get kind of a 360 handle, maybe 370, you know, maybe not a bad time. Um, I'm not I'm not quite sure we get all the way back up to 4%. So what I've been telling investors is don't get too cute. You know, you're not playing for 20 basis points here. You're playing for protection in your portfolio for the 10 year to go from 350 to 250, right? You're playing for kind of that long run fall in rates as the economy potentially slows. And if it doesn't, you have enough yield and fixed income to protect you for rates rising. You can still have positive returns given the high yields you can get in many parts of the market. Well, the bond market basically thinks we're cutting rates pretty surprisingly. I mean, it thinks by September that we're going to have one cut and we're going to be down almost 100 basis points lower by the beginning of next year, which is kind of why some parts of the stock market are doing well, like mega cap tech, which is kind of, you know, almost like a rate play at times when, when rates go down, big tech likes to go up. It's kind of has, has duration, they say, in the equity markets. 
Um, but, you know, one would think that if this plays out, it's pretty negative for the economy. So broadly speaking, you probably see growth slowing in the economy, turning over, earnings rolling over, and then equities reprice. So um, I'm not sure we see this happen with rates coming down this quickly. Uh, there, you know, the, the economy is kind of a mixed bag. We'll look at some data shortly, but at some point I do think rates come down. So we still like rates for the long run. Uh, we think that we will make money on rates falling. It's just that short-term rates may not fall as aggressively as the market's implying here on the left-hand side. A couple things the Fed has going for it, though, um, is that uh, break-evens are relatively anchored. There was a moment in time in early 2023, the blue line, the two-year break-even, uh, shot up pretty dramatically. And that was not a good thing. That was pre-SVB. And if you look back to the last time that happened, that was in kind of right before the hikes in early 2022, which led to a big shakeup in markets, increased volatility, stocks down, spreads wider. And that's come back down. Uh, it's come back down pretty dramatically. In fact, you can see that it's collapsed from like 340-ish down to sub 2%. This is one of the reasons I think that you've seen credit spreads kind of hold in here is the anchoring of those short-term and, and intermediate-term and I guess long-term in inflation expectations. So the market, at least priced by tips, is saying that inflation has calmed down. So as we look at kind of the broader fixed income markets, this is my what's cheap report that we look at every month now on channel 11. This is available, this packet's available, or a packet that this is in is available. Uh, reach out to your local sales representative if you'd like it. It's pretty helpful. We release this once a month. And this shows the different pockets of fixed income, looking at the cheapness relative to their own history, going back 10 years. So right now, the stuff at the very top, um, and I'll just point out to the top left uh, that really stand out right now, in both 90, kind of 98th, 99th percentile, I guess 97th for CMBS, it was 98th at the end of the month in April. Uh, meaning that, for example, agency mortgage spreads, only 1% of the trading days over the last 10 years has the spread been wider. And on May 15th, it was 174. The high in October was about 179. So basically retested the October highs and wides on spreads there. Um, IG is definitely cheaper than it was, I would say, you know, 30 to 60 days ago. IG got all the way down to sub 50th percentile, maybe mid to high 40s. Um, and uh, it's backed up here. So it's looking a little bit cheaper, high yield on the richer end um, relative to its own history. But it's, that means it's done well. And so whenever I show this to people, they, some say, well, what are you trying to hide from me? Why did you go only, only, go, only go back 10 years? Well, 10 years is a nice round number which is why we go back 10 years, but also some of these indices didn't exist 10 years ago. So we went back 20, we said, okay, we'll do the, what about the GFC slide? Here it is. And this takes the indices that we have data for going back now 20 years. And we can see on this metric, this will make credit look more expensive since it got really wide during the GFC. And you can see that mortgages still look pretty cheap on this on this basis, 81st percentile. So you look at this and you'll tell me, well, Ken, what about bank loans? Bank loans also look pretty cheap. They do, but they might be cheap for a reason. Uh, bank loan funding costs have gone up a lot with the short-term rates higher. So a company that was funding at LIBOR plus 500, you know, two years ago with LIBOR at zero is now funding at 10%, not 5%, with effectively doubling their cost of debt. And so um, that's just something to to think about doesn't mean there's not great opportunities out there so we will um will um you know we can still pick and choose our battles we don't buy bank loans in income but we have that exposure to clos a mix of triple b and double b clos that um have uh, pretty high yields now with the sofa rates up here's just a graphical uh observation of what's called the current coupon mbs spread this is the bond that's trading closest to par backed by mortgage loans that are created today which are around a six and a half percent mortgage. You strip out servicing fee, you gotta pay Fannie Freddie and Ginnie Mae to wrap the deal and make it government guaranteed. So you're left with about a five and a half percent coupon bond that's trading around par. And you can see that spread got all the way to 179 October of last year. We rallied into pre-SVB down into the 120s. And now we've backed up to kind of 174 with a lot of supply coming from the FDIC sales of the Silicon Valley Bank assets through BlackRock which so far have been digested pretty well. There's been pretty good demand from the market. 
Um, there's also, you know, a lot of supply is down. We're probably going to be down 50% in origination volumes in the MBS market. So while there's a supply headwind of the SVB assets, there's, you know, a potential tailwind of lack of origination. So if there's any net marginal demand because spreads are wider from money managers, insurance companies, other buyers, um, you know, unfortunately the banks aren't buying because the banks are all worried about deposits leaving. But as, as other money steps in, seeing relative value um, that could contain spreads here. So I just, I don't see that much more downside. We got to the 250, 300 area on spread during the GFC. You can see that on this slide. That was from a brief moment in time. That's when we thought Fannie and Freddie were going under. So that's kind of worst case scenario for agency mortgages. Um, Fannie and Freddie did go under, they got taken into conservatorship. And so while there's some potential downside in spread, I think there's way less downside in agency mortgage spreads and for example, corporate bonds that um, have, a, have a tighter spread um, on um, kind of the index and um, have credit risk. All right, so let's talk about macro before we dive deeper into the portfolio. And the most important thing, I guess, that's out there continues to be inflation. Here's a look at the three components of inflation. Core goods in the gray uh, is what initially spiked, right? The supply chain issues, the, all the ships sitting off Long Beach Harbor, at one point there was like 100 of them just lined up waiting to come in. That is now coming down as that front-loaded demand for goods subsides. You can see this in PMI manufacturing printing below 50. The goods demand is weakening, right? People bought cars, people bought you know, a washer dryer. They only need one. They don't need one every year. And so that is expected to come down. What's What caught up and is now going to seems to be remaining sticky is shelter, which is in the blue, um, and then core services, X shelter, and services are driven by wages. And we have a supply demand imbalance in the job market. And so that's what the Fed's conundrum is, and that's why they're saying they're not going to cut rates, unlike what the bond market's pricing in. So look, look at, let's look at some slides on those things. We got a lot of housing exposure in the portfolio. We saw the exposure to RMBS. We saw the exposure to CMBS, of which there's some multifamily exposure, but housing um, to the to, to the detriment of the inflation fight remains resilient. It's about down 5% from the peak. The peak was the summer of last year as far as home prices. And the reason it's not collapsing like some of the haters that were calling for you know down 30, 40% like the GFC is they don't look at the data. They just like to say, you know they think it's like a bond price, yields up, home prices down. It doesn't work like that. There's plenty of times going back through history where rates went higher, like through the 70s and 80s and 90s, when we had a rise in rates and we had home prices go up. It really comes down to supply demand. And here you can see that existing inventory is close to um, all time lows. This, this, I, I have data going back prior to 1999, but trust me when I tell you that we're near all time lows. All time lows happened kind of during COVID. We got down to about 850,000 units of existing inventory relative to a continually growing population. And we've been underbuilding. And so this shows you housing starts in the blue versus household formation. Right, people um, creating households. And we've been building less homes and household formation since the GFC, leading to a pretty large cumulative housing shortfall in the millions. This, per this metric, we're 6 million underbuilt on housing. So lack of supply, millennials still needing to buy homes. That means prices don't go down that much. We're down again, 5% nationally. Some regions that went up a lot, especially kind of the tech heavy regions are down Seattle, uh, San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego, probably down low teens, you know, Boise, Boise, not surprisingly, but demographics are holding up some of these regional areas in the Southeast um, where you're seeing population migration to low tax states like Florida, right? Even if we go into recession, we've got ton of equity in homes. People do not walk away from equity. So they'll sell their house, they'll take their equity. This shows you the percentage of underwater mortgages that we had during the GFC in green or turquoise and look how low it is. Like a lot of people just have a ton of equity in their house. Home prices are up a lot. And if they bought a house, house even today, you have to put money down. So that means you're not gonna walk away from your house. So what's, why do I show the slides? To A, make you feel good about mortgage credit allocations and mortgage credit performance. But B, if home prices don't go down, then likely rent per rental rates don't go down that much either. Um, and that's gonna mean that, that, that uh, shelter component of CPI, which tends to lag about by about 12 to 18 months, probably isn't falling that quickly. 
So that could stay elevated, um, which again is not good for the Fed, which means they may be um, keeping their rates higher for longer. Doesn't mean they need to hike again, but at least keep rates here for a while, not cut immediately in September. And the other dilemma they have is the fact that wages remain strong. So here is average hourly wages in red, Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker in blue. Both seem to have peaked. They've come down. Hourly earnings down a decent amount off its highs, but it's still it's still elevated. I mean, it's still five percent. So they're looking at this. They're looking at the 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 you know the the job openings, which fell from its peak of around 11.5 million job openings to 9.5, but that's still elevated relative to the people looking for work. And so um, they're worried that this stays kind of elevated and they need more slack in the labor market before they can cut rates. The problem they have is that is backwards looking. Unemployment is the last thing to rise when you go in the recession. So what they need to do is look at some of the forward looking metrics that we look at and see um, are kind of in recessionary ter territory. Here's LEI. We show this a lot. Probably see it from me, from from uh, Jeffrey Gunlock, from Jeffrey Sherman, uh, on on our um, different webcasts, and it's been negative like seven, eight, seven, eight months in a row, and it usually leads recessions. And usually by the time we're this deep negative in LEI, you're in the recession. So um, we do have some things that are positive. I will say, uh, while manufacturing, as I suggested earlier, is printing below 50, 47.1 here. Um, which is contractionary territory. Services PMI still slightly positive here, 51.9. Retail sales came in okay. And the Home Depot said that consumer slowing down. But, you know, there's kind of this mixed bag economy that's going on out there, consumer being kind of resilient with maybe some pent up savings, but they're starting to go through that, right? The other metric, this is the Powell's metric that he likes, the, the Fed likes that the 10 year, three month instead of the 10 year, two year inversion. Um, and this uh, saw this big spike um, of this inversion uh, right after SVB. This got all the way down to about 180 basis points at one one point. It's now now at 162 as of whatever date this was, which I don't see on my screen. Oh, May 15th. Um, and again, usually when this flips this negative, you're almost every time I've seen a recession here. So again, these are kind of the recession watch things out there. It doesn't mean that we can't muddle along here and have another positive quarter of GDP, thanks to the consumer. Um, but just things we like to point out and say, hey, these are reasons we've been extending duration in some of our portfolios. Um, even in income, we're a little bit longer than we historically have been. Um, one thing that's kind of not, doesn't always work for recessions, but I just wanted to point it out because I do think it's interesting about the behavior of the consumer is that we had all this pent up savings, thanks to the stimulus checks, we started spending, 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 and dropping our savings rate. This is like a monthly savings rate as a percentage of disposable income. And it kind of was dropping, it was almost alarming. And you could say, okay, well, inflation's high, so people got to spend more money for food and at the tank and so on and so forth. Um, and it's gone up um, very recently. So has it gone up because people are getting paid more or is it going up because people are worried about the future? We've got some a lot of negative consumer sentiment data and people start saving when they're worried about maybe they need money for a rainy day. So. That's just something to think about is what does this mean, this, this increased savings rate? While there are there, there are pent up savings that the consumer has in the in the bank, uh, I think I saw the latest number was 500 billion down from over a trillion right after all the stimmy checks. Um, they're, they're, they're spending through that. Um, and so maybe once they spend a little bit more through that, they may want to start building the back up for that rainy day. And that means a slowdown in consumption. That can also be a catalyst for slowing growth. So. Just some things to think about, not like doom and gloom end of the world right now, but um, just that there, there are risks out there, there are signs that economy could be slowing. And so maybe one should be a little bit more conservative with their kind of asset allocation, especially equities that seem, you know, um, more uh, more positively priced with, you know, a, a push back up in earnings expectations on the S&P 500 in the fourth quarter. Whereas I think fixed income, at least parts of fixed income seem to be, seem to be pricing in a little bit more risk with spreads being wider. Now, the bank, the banking issue is something new from the last time we had an income webcast. You know, the last time we had one was about six months ago. And when SVB happened, I turned more negative because I thought, why would anyone ever leave their bank, their money in a regional bank and not just buy T-bills and money markets and just hang out and enjoy <laughs> higher yields and the almost nothing they pay you in the checking account or savings account. And we saw that spike, it's kind of going sideways. 
Um, I think just money is a little lazy. If you're under the 250K FDIC balance, maybe you're not so worried. But I think the longer that this banking issues get stretched out, the longer the curve is inverted, the more banks that potentially go under, the more to the forefront that, you know, this type of, um, you know, reality comes out to mom and pop that, hey, look, maybe I should just be in the big money center banks and maybe I should put some more money in money markets and things like that. This is a strain on bank deposits. And I think they've already pulled back and they'll pull back even more. They're big lenders to small business. Small business is 46% of employment in the US. And so I think that was the catalyst for me that, hey, maybe that's gonna push us over the edge into a recession towards the end of the year. Now, so far, the money hasn't come out as, as fast as I expected. It's kind of slowed down a lot, but maybe it picks up. So I like to watch this data. Uh, we'll keep our eyes on it. Um, but uh, I think on the margin, you know, I've had some anecdotal conversations with some small regional banks, and they all say not only have they been pulling back, but borrowers aren't looking for the money. And maybe that's just because rates are so high. I mean, if you're borrowing as a small business at like prime plus 500 or something, you're talking about double digit cost of funds. It's like, do I really want to borrow at that rate? Maybe I'll just hold off for opening another store or restaurant and or hiring some more people and kind of wait for more clarity, wait for the Fed to cut, wait for you know, the economic certainty to, you know, become better that this is going to be not a hard land landing, but a soft landing. So uh, I think watch this data. We'll keep you posted on any changes we see. Um, if not on the next income webcast, you can check into the next channel 11. And on that note, uh, let me just look through some of these questions really quick that I can answer before hanging it off to Morris. Um, something about bonds a loser if the economy shifts to stagflation. It depends what level of inflation exists with this with the slow growth. You would think that that would have just created an inverted curve with the inflation being fought by short, high short-term rates, but long-term rates would see that eventually um, that's going to cause a slowdown in the economy. So I think you just have that inversion. We kind of have that inversion right now. So I mean, in some ways, the market's just pricing that in. Over the last one year, um, Dblix has been uh, uh, underperforming some of the other bond funds. And uh, I mentioned it earlier. I said, you know, we have that um, exposure to some of those esoteric bonds in the ABS space that got hit when some liquidations came out of Credit Suisse. We've got a high yield. We're going to earn our way out of that. And then we have some assets that have wide spreads relative to other sectors that eventually we'll see some price appreciation on those and hopefully some recovery in those ABS bonds too. So. Um, unfortunately, we had that allocation and, and we got hit uh, with that um, liquidation coming out of CS. Pre a question on prepayments. Prepayments are super slow right now, which means the market is already pricing in slow prepayments. Rates could fall and there would still be muted prepayments. So mortgage prepayment risk in the MBS market is very low. It's one of the lowest prepayment risk environments that we've seen in the MBS market. In, in, in decades because of how high rates are relative to where mortgages are. A couple of questions on CMBS. Um, I'll let Morris answer that question on um, higher rates by the Fed. Yeah, I think the Fed could maybe go one more time, but I think after that, they'll slow down and, and give it time to see how things shake out. What do you think about munis right now? Um, yes, it feels kind of rich. I've looked at them for the PA and um, the longer end munis look kind of expensive. Any opinion on preferreds? I don't know. Just I don't think I never was a huge fan of bank preferreds. You know, you just I, I just felt like you know they're perpetual potentially, and so you just have this you know never-ending risk that's out there. I know the tax uh, tr treatment is good. Um, can you discuss MBS spread to the Fed stop QT? Uh, the Fed stopping QT and or rate vol coming down should bring MBS spreads in. All right, so that's, uh, I just want to save some time for Morris. So I'm going to pass along to Morris uh, to talk about the rest of the portfolio. Thanks, Morris. All right, thanks, Ken. Hello, everyone. So we're diving into the portfolio. Um, you know, we'll, we'll start with commercial real estate first. With respect to what we're seeing on the, on the boots on the ground in terms of commercial real estate, uh, again, there's a tighter lending uh, environment that's that's ongoing at this juncture. I would just point out, markets somewhat self-regulating. Uh, this is an environment where lending was loose coming into uh, this rate high, hiking cycle. Uh, I think uh, you know the environment in itself is uh, the stresses that's causing the commercial real estate right now is higher interest rates. It's less about uh, deterioration in terms of credit quality or or looser lending. 
Uh, but uh, in essence, self-regulation, you're, you're seeing this from a loan to value perspective in terms of leverage ratios. Uh, it dropped precipitously uh, as, as the Fed continued to, to hike rates. Even into 2022, I would say that loan to values were, were low. Um, and as we're kind of thinking uh, out on the horizon, or we're looking at commercial bond spreads. Here, you can definitely see the recent changes in terms of spreads, spread widening across, uh, across the capital structure. A lot of this due to a combination of negative headlines surrounding commercial real estate in conjunction with the uncertainty uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that investors are looking out on their horizon for commercial real estate properties. And then you layer in uh, what happened in March, the regional uh, bank uh, uh, dilemma, and that's, uh, that's um, you know, puts together a, a concoction of reasons that CMBS spreads decide to widen. I would say that the as we were kind of looking at CMBS market, it, it definitely looks interesting. I mean, just even looking back on a 10-year uh, 10-year horizon, similar to uh, the uh, the analysis that we looked at across the structured products uh, 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 sectors, CMBS does screen cheap, even on a percentile basis uh, in terms of spreads. Um, now, going into relative value versus corporates, again, um, AAAs versus investment grade corporate, AAA CMBS versus investment grade corporates. On the left-hand side, you can see the blue line um, screening cheaper relative to corporates, uh, and then even more pronounced where triple Bs relative to high yield. I would point out uh, it's not without risk. Clearly, the market is trying to price in some risk as, uh, associated with uh, potential uh, uh, potential uh, headwinds that commercial real estate market will potentially face. Um, you know, a lot of this has to do with office as well, uh, in terms of office exposure, underlying transactions. Uh, but like I tell investors, you know, keep in mind this is the, these are debt in instruments. These are debt investments. You are in the mortgage uh, and the bonds collateralizing uh, these uh, uh, that that are, uh, are are made up of multiple different mortgages underlying commercial mortgages that are diversified in nature. I think risk is largely going to be idiosyncratic uh, at this juncture. Uh, but with that said, some deals may trade wide because it may have a concentrated exposure to certain office ex uh, offices uh, and, and, and vice versa. Looking at you know price changes, uh, again, we saw spreads movement. So clearly prices also changed as well. Um, you know, we're, you know, heading in, uh, we have been heading in the direction of, you know, near the uh, co March of 2020 lows, uh, I think across the capital structure, uh, in essence, this repricing is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, uh, reticent of what was experienced during March of 2020, which for the reasons uh, during 2020 was, was more of a liquidity uh, situation as opposed to currently we're trying to price in fundamental deterioration. And now kind of diving into the fund, I mean, we are about 20% exposure within commercial mortgage bonds within the fund. And here, I just want to point out to everyone, you know, we do have different subsectors of CMBS uh, comprised of conduit uh, securities. Uh, these are, you know, backed by multiple loans. These are CMBS bonds backed by multiple loans. Uh, typically, loans are fixed rate in nature uh, that are 10 years in term uh, from the original issue date. CRE CLOs, these are uh, shorter duration, um, similar to corporate CLOs in a, in, in, in a way, uh, but backed by shorter floating rate commercial real estate loans that are, you know, uh, from a pool standpoint itself, have multiple borrowers and multiple different uh, underlying loans and properties. And then SASB is a single asset, single bar, uh, typically floating rate transaction uh, that are backed by one property or a portfolio of properties. Uh, with one borrower. So um, as you can see, again, you know, from um, a risk metric perspective, there is significant credit enhancement. I mean, even in our conduit portfolio, we have about 37% in credit enhancement or subordination at our tranche level LTV. So meaning the bond rating and the bonds that we specifically own, if you were to just peer through based on where the mortgage is and where the bond is, is uh, structured, um, those are the the LTV for conduits is 39%. Similarly, in series sales, it's also around 39%. And then for our SASB, it's 66% loan to value. I, these are important to you know kind of point out 
um, as we're kind of diving into our, uh, our property type exposure, we do have a fairly diversified portfolio of properties. Uh, again, you know, you know, thinking about the loan to value nature of where we own these bonds, we do think we're adequately collateralized uh, and protected um, despite the headwinds that we're seeing. A lot of the repricing is has to do with, uh, uh, within CMBS has to do with extension. So, you know, investors are trying to rationalize what, when the timing of payback would be for particular loans that are underlying these pools. Um, I would say generically, there has been market dynamics where investors are just blanketly uh, and extending loans uh, for the sake of extending, but not really paying attention to what exactly are the underlying uh, 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 pool look look like, and you know that dynamic in itself presents opportunities. Um, going into the consumer-oriented uh, section of our portfolio, where you're looking at consumer loans, we have seen um, consumer loan delinquencies trending higher since uh, since the lows in terms of June of 2021, um, particularly in the lower credit score. Uh, 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 area where uh, the FICO scores are, are lower. Um, and I think from a trend uh, perspective in itself, while delinquencies have been trending up, um, I'd say that, you know, generally speaking, consumer loans in, in terms of where we are in terms of these delinquencies compared versus previous cycles, we're still at, uh, at very, very low levels or below those levels. Thinking about the uh, you know consumer loan uh, sector, just given the delinquency in terms of fundamentals, here now we're seeing yields uh, of these securities. Uh, on the left-hand side of this chart, you're seeing single A yields at currently at 7.57% relative to 20 where these where yields were in December of 2021, where you know you're about almost sixfold uh, in terms of uh, in terms of yield. Pickup relative to the uh, the 2021 environment. You know, the caveat would be yes, rates were extremely low in 2021, but I would kind of point out also spreads have widened uh, in a in a meaningful manner, even in the ABS consumer loan side. And you know, for triple B, same picture. And you know, as we're kind of looking out the looking out uh, into the fundamental uh, world, there is a relative value component. You know, you're getting these excess yields. You're getting exposure to consumer loans, but I would point out, just given the, you know, the the credit enhancement that uh, that is that you know, we're currently seeing within these bonds, a lot of these bonds are pretty short. So even for a triple B tranche, uh, that's fairly short. Um, you know, given the delivery nature of these profiles, you're seeing credit enhancement or subordination continue to build as consumer loans pay off. Um, so here on the right hand side you're seeing CE build uh, from the date of issuance relative to the seasoning of the transaction. At the very bottom uh, portion of the, uh, of the chart in the green, those are cum uh, cumulative net loss um, uh, that's experienced. You know, it peaks out around 10%, but as you can see for single A, even for triple B bonds, over time, um, you have significant amount of protection and we think uh, at these yields, uh, a lot of these investments make a lot of sense. On a relative value basis, similar to the CMBS picture, um, you're, you're seeing senior ABS uh, screen cheap relative to corporates. Uh, similarly, for other areas of below AAA, um, so AA to triple B uh, asset backed securities, they're also uh, compare uh, on a relative value basis um, screen cheaper versus corporate triple B as well. So there is a thematic tone as we're looking uh, within structure credit, you know, whether it's CMBS or ABS, um, <clears throat> and including RMBS, you're definitely getting that, that relative value um, um, pickup. <clears throat> Looking into the corporate world as we're thinking about CLOs within within the fund, um, we would point out that you know just relative to default rates, default rates have been low. Um, there has been you know a we do have an internal view that defaults will continue to but likely pick up starting at the lower rated uh, lower rated companies or riskier companies. Uh, but I think in essence, if you just think about the CLOs market um, um, relative to what we experienced during the GFC, so here is a good comparison. During the GFC, um, CLO 1.0 transactions, so issues, uh, transactions issued prior to 2000, 2009 and prior, AAA has experienced zero defaults, 
Similarly, um, double A's uh, only experience about one default out of 616 transactions. And you can kind of get the thematic uh, tone here where even for during the GFC, CLOs were adequately um, protected, at least the performance of the underlying transaction, alignment, alignment of incentive in terms of the manager uh, that's managing those deals helps uh, uh, in conjunction with the diversification of underlying pool uh, helps alleviate stresses underlying the uh, underlying those bonds. And now looking to the right hand side where you're looking at deals issued uh, 2010 and later, again, defaults have been extremely low, not too surprising, just given corporate defaults have also been low. Uh, but you know, we're pointing this out that you know, the CLO market, um, there's a reason why it's popular. Um, <clears throat> as a function of that, the yields have also gapped out. Um, um, similarly uh, to other structured credit, where uh, even on a yield basis, you're seeing it uh, near its sort of 10-year highs uh, within the corporate CLO market. So, you know, net net, you know, whether it's CMBS, ABS, and or corporate CLOs um, within the securitized uh, product cohort, you're definitely seeing this same thematic tone where spreads have widened um, and um, and yields are high uh, relative to corporates. So, um, you know, looking through, you know, here we have, you know, DBLIX in terms of our CLO exposure, we do own about 50% of our portfolio is in, is primarily in investment grade, about, you know, 50% is in, is, is in double B. Again, just given the credit enhancement of the types of products that we own, we do have significant protection uh, within our, within our portfolio. So that concludes, uh, at least in terms of the sector, subsector sort of dive, deep dive, uh, includes my section as we're talking about that. And, you know, kind of going into some of the questions, I, I understand there was a CMBS question, uh, particular to um, CMBS conduit market in terms of the five and five and a half percent allocation uh, within conduit. And do we expect to increase or decrease over time? And how is that market trading? Um, I would say, as you're thinking about the CMBS market, there is definitely value in the conduit uh, market. I do like, it's one of my favorites. It's largely because the conduit pools uh, are diversified. There are a lot of different uh, underlying loans uh, within the pool uh, and the outcomes, uh, while it could potentially be idiosyncratic, that diversification helps a lot. And then, you know, you know looping into the, uh, uh, the reasons why also diversification the structural provisions and structural protections uh, that you are able to get. We can pick and choose which tranches we want to be in. Um, for within DBLIX, uh, within this fund, we definitely see uh, we do own some conduit uh, exposure in here. Again, those pools are diversified. And so the outcomes in itself is, is um, um, uh, will, will be a, a very, very diversified in terms of, uh, in terms of um, harvesting returns. Um, I, if you were to give me a dollar today, I definitely would be looking for conduit um, over, say, um, SAS, the SASB market, uh, just for reference. Bid ask spread, spread wide, uh, wise, uh, anything below AAA, the bid ask is becoming wide, and that's largely because of extension. So again, as I kind of pointed out, investors are are thinking about extension risk. Um, it's less about principle when you're thinking when you're looking at the investment rate components of the. CMBS market. It's more about extension risk. So the timing of payback, a bond that is one year can can potentially extend out to a year and a half or two. And as a function of that, the pricing mechanism uh, for those securities needs to be reflected as such. So we're going through this this current the current cycle uh, of um, the CMBS market spread widening is largely because investors are trying to price the worst. Um, and that, you know, creates opportunities and you know that's one of the reasons why you know we're constructive within the CMBS market despite the headlines that we're seeing and despite some of the headwinds uh, because a lot of these deals are structured appropriately there's been you know a lot of good collateral underlying these transactions um, and you know we have seen loans pay off uh, in a timely manner so um, that concludes the extent of this uh, the current webcast and I appreciate everyone's attention. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue on uh, later this year. Uh, but thank you for the support and uh, wish everyone uh, good luck.